Today we are analyzing Huntington Bank Shares Incorporated, ticker HBAN. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts about the valuation of this company and its business quality. We have the market cap of $16.4 billion, enterprise value of $19.8 billion, so see about $3.5 billion in net debt on this business. Not uncommon for a bank. This company is operating in the banking industry. They are a holding company for the Huntington National Bank. They provide commercial, consumer, mortgage banking services in the United States. They have segments in consumer and business banking, commercial banking, vehicle finance, and regional banking and the Huntington Private Capital Client Group. All these sound pretty normal. Um, the only one that's a little different, this capital group appears to offer private banking, wealth, and investment management, and retirement plan services. They're headquartered in Columbus, Ohio, so a base that primarily serving the Ohio and surrounding areas. Um, banks of this size, of course, are unlikely to be national-style banks, more regional in size. So return on equity, it looks like they've been profitable um, 18 of the last 20 years. They lost money in the financial crisis, 2008 and 2009, but were profitable again in 2010. Um, they had, you know, they're earning basically around a 10%. It looks like return on equity on a general year. They had some down years during COVID, 6%, 8%, but they're back to a 12% return on equity here in 2022. Um, unfortunately, the financial crisis, they lost quite a bit of money. In 2009, they lost 49% of their equity. Um, that's basically a wipeout. When you lose half your equity, you're talking about needing a whole decade almost to recover that. Um, you know, if you're earning 10% returns, it's going to double in like seven to eight years. So you need to be aware of that, that that's actually a big risk, that they were taking a lot of risk in the financial crisis. One thing you want to look at in banks is how they manage um, crises and, and what they did in the financial crisis. And right here, this is a pretty red, big red mark for this business. So although they're very stable, they're earning good returns here, it looked the same going into the financial crisis. You see 2003. 16%, 16%, 16%, 16%, all the way to 2006, it crashed down to 1% and then losses in 2008, 2009. So just goes to show that when you're thinking about banks, no matter how stable they look, even though on any other company, this would be very exciting, you have to be aware that this is always a risk. Now, if you were to look at a bank and they actually did well during the financial crisis, they avoided losing money or they only had a very narrow loss, that would be one thing. Something like a 50% drop in the equity though is very concerning. Um, besides that, we have some really good numbers here that I like what I'm seeing. So return on equity, 10.8%. I'd like this to be the 15% range, but they are in range with the return on assets. A quick rule of thumb for banks is if you 10X the return on assets, that's a pretty normal leverage point. So 1.1% would take you to an 11% return on equity. That tends to match up. Now, PE ratio of 6.8% and less than a price to book of one starts to get attractive here. Price to equity of seven, rounding up a little bit, is saying, hey, we're getting a pretty cheap price for this business. There's a lot of earnings here. Um, you're talking about an earnings yield that's in that you know, 13, 14% range. Um, it's a very nice earning yields to start. And then you look at your CAGA, you're actually growing at a pretty good rate. Net interest income growing at 11.9%. Loans growing at 10%, earning assets 12%, deposits 12.3%. All of this is very strong double-digit growth. So when you think about this, if this was any company other than a bank, this would look extremely attractive. We'd be almost immediately talking about watch list type stocks because what you have here, and this is common for a lot of banks these days, is you're getting very cheap prices on very good growth numbers. And this combination is rare. This sort of setup is what can lead to, you know, double digit, mid double digit returns, you know, 10, 12, 15% type returns. When you get a strong starting equity yield plus strong growth, pretty good double digit return on equity. This is a very strong setup for future returns in the company. The big risk, of course, here, but something to be aware of is that these sorts of things are not common with non-banks. And so we're getting some nice setup here. Assets to equity seem normal. One of the things you'd want to look for at the bank is are the assets to equity changing a lot? Are they going significantly beyond this 10x number? But they're hovering around that 9 to 10x number pretty well. Um, earnings per share, of course, doubling over the course of a decade, doing pretty well, 72 cents to $1.45. Um, dividends have gone from 20 cent, you know, 19 cents to 62 cents. So they've tripled over the course of the decade. Not uncommon that your dividends are going to grow faster than your earnings in something like a bank. It's really hard to reinvest consistently over a very long time period with banks. You see their net interest margins pretty stable here at around the 3 to 3.3%. You're hovering in that range, so pretty good there as well. Um, 
Let's see, everything looks good. Nothing out of the ordinary here, nothing abnormal um, that would cause me to be concerned besides the financial crisis. So income statement, if you're enjoying this video so far, hit that like button, don't forget to subscribe. You can like the video, even if you don't like the stock, great way to support the channel and get more of my videos recommended to you from YouTube. Now, so interest expense, you can see their interest expense has gone up significantly over the last year. That's very common for banks um, because interest rates have gone up so much but you also the nice thing with banks is they're able to reprice a lot of loans so your interest income has going up significantly the important number of course being the net interest income and that continues to grow so of course they've tripled it in the decade that's looking very good um provision for credit losses they're not extraordinarily high it's not like they're that much higher um, than normal they are higher but not just extraordinarily so you're still getting a good net interest income after provisions now, key thing here is the expenses. They've been growing their expenses, but they're not growing their expenses as much as they did before. Um, you can see non-interest expense going up quite significantly. They've doubled their non-interest revenue, and they've more than doubled their non-interest expense. So you do have um, a pretty high non-interest expense here of $4.2 billion, but you're still getting a pretty good pre-tax income here of almost $3 billion. Um, net income here, $2.4 billion. Now, something that I'm concerned about is the shares outstanding. So your shares outstanding has gone up a lot. 844 million shares to 1.4 billion shares. It is not at all clear why this is necessary. So when we look back at our growth rates, you're growing at basically 11 to 12% a year. Your return on equity is almost 11%. There's no reason to dilute shareholders in order to grow at this rate. You have the return on equity in order to retain the earnings to maintain this growth rate. But it looks like what they're doing is they are issuing shares to grow. And that is a big red flag to me. So you've been able to grow nicely, but why are they issuing so many shares? Are they acquiring new banks? What's going on here? They're issu they've issued a lot of shares. So securities and investments, 9.4 billion to 40 billion. Gross loans have almost tripled. Again, I like the growth. You know, banks don't have a lot of PPE. They're gonna be heavily, you know, the banks are capital intensive in the sense that they earn from their capital. They earn from loans, they earn from securities, they earn from cash. So they need that capital to grow. They've grown their deposit base. That's a very good sign almost tripled or basically tripled their deposit base. Why are they taking in so, so the paid in capital has gone up a lot. What are they doing here? Cash flow statement, PPE, investments. They don't have any big acquisitions here. Net issuance, they do have stock-based compensation. Why a bank is having stock-based compensation is just crazy to me. Um, this is completely unnecessary. Uh, cash paid for dividends. Net issuance of debt. Okay, so I can't figure this out. You'd have to do a deeper study on the annual report to get a better idea of what they're doing here, why this is happening. Um, but for me, this would be a reason I would not own the bank for myself. I don't own banks that are heavily diluting you. And it, you know, it's okay if you're diluting half a percent a year, 1% a year, even like 2% a year, 2% is a little high, but if you're under 2% a year, then fine. It means over the decade, you're gonna have maybe 20% more shares, assuming you don't do any buybacks. Um, but they have a lot of cash, so they should be able to do buybacks. I don't know why they're diluting so much. This is massive dilution. You've diluted basically 80% over the course of a decade. That's gonna be like a 70%. Like like a seven percent per year, six to seven percent per year headwind for growing your EPS, and it's completely unnecessary. Um, so that's why the EPS has only grown like seven percent a year, even though you're growing your income and you're earning the assets at twelve percent a year. There, there's, it's just a massive headwind. Um, so for that reason, Huntington Bank shares, which looked up until this moment to be on track to be on my watch list, is not going to make my watch list because I don't want to own a bank that is heavily diluting me. It's still could be interesting for those who want a cheap price if you think they're going to change in the future if you think they can continue to grow and maybe they're going to change their capital allocation it could be a very interesting investment but for me it's not a good fit if you enjoyed this video hit that like button don't forget to subscribe and you can check out my other videos the ones that did make my watch list and the playlist up above youtube will recommend a video for you just down below and 
I would also check out this quickfs.net software. I recommend using this software and my affiliate link is the first link in the description below. I hope you'll check it out. If you use my link to sign up, free or paid account, I can get a commission for sending you over to them. I use it myself. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you for listening. Until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.